Hello again. We're back with another rare gem whose depth we've already mined in a making of video in Rare Replay. But this is a series so packed with stuff, we can easily dig up another five things to say. Anyway, we couldn't stay mad at Viva Piñata. Who could? Look at it. So come on, grab your watering can and a good solid shovel to smack down some ruffians and let's garden. With 60 species in the first game alone, there was a whole lot of stuff to name in Viva Piñata. But first we had to, you know, find a name for the game. Naming in Piñata was uh, quite a difficult process. First of all, we had a game that was about Piñata. So we just called it Piñata, Inside Rare. And we really quite like that name. It seemed to describe everything you needed to know about the game, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a name that you could trademark or license or do any of those kind of corporate things with. So we had to think of a something new that was something pinata. The solution to all our naming problems, we would always throw it out into the team and see just a ridiculous sheet of all the lists of all the ridiculous names we could possibly think of in case it sparked somebody's imagination and we got something useful but we had quite a lot of dreadful things. <laughs> uh, yes, Lotso Piñata, uh, Microsoft Piñata Simulator, and Viva Piñata came out at the end because Viva was uh, life, so living Piñata, that it seemed to fit, thank goodness. Also on the shortlist were Loco Piñata, which would have been fine, and whole lot of Piñata, which wouldn't. So count your blessings. Now, what about naming all those individual beasties? And then the same naming process went for all the animals as well, because all those had to be copyrighted. And because then we got the piñata thing, we knew they had to be sweet related. But again, we did lots of those in-house of the team. And then um, we were naming them after sweets and realised that some of the sweets were only available in the UK or only available in certain countries. And actually, they weren't international names at all. In fact, some of them came out as rude things that we didn't really know at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we're perfect innocents, but we'd, we'd already got a reputation of trying to get rude things into games, so we were kind of under double scrutiny for everything we came up with after that. Completely unwarranted, we might add. Anyway, let's not dwell on that. We've got hard facts to get through. One of the things we're asked most often is, what didn't make it into VP1 and 2? And we've mentioned a few things over the years, like the kangaroo piñata and the rattlesnake, and the idea of traveling the world in a caravan. But let's see who can remember what other features didn't work out in the end and why. The, the complex nature of piñata meant that it was um, a technical minefield, I think, in a lot of areas when we were starting to develop it. I remember uh, my friend Phil, he was um, entrenched in the AI side of things, and I can remember the, the horrific nightmares of trying to get animals of all shapes and sizes to work together. I can remember particularly at one point we were trying to experiment with whether you could have piñatas of different sizes so you could play uh, some sort of potion or some sort of trading card on them and they would grow and shrink and I think it was the giraffes that eventually made him lose his rag because they were these tiny things in terms of width but then these behemoths in terms of height so they were there clunking into all the trees and walking around so that's partly why they never made it. There were so many animals that didn't, didn't make it. So many, so many different animals. There was, there was water animals as well that we wanted to try and get in at one point. It was like fish and particularly for, for VP2 as well because um, we had we had a concept um, that had just like a shark and things like that that were just going to be aquatic animals. So yeah, you never really saw aquatic animals but we did get it in because the cat, um, cat girl in the, in the pet shop, she's got a goldfish um, in a goldfish ball on her head. And that, that right at the start, that was the only, the only aquatic piñata. Yeah. So we got it in there somehow. And it was just, it was the trying to get an animal to cope with all sorts of situations. And every time that we had a new feature, be it like squazzles climbing trees or swimming animals, every time we tried to add something new, you then had to make sure it could work with the 60 plus animals that were already in there. And then inevitably one wouldn't work. One wouldn't work in some way, shape or form. So you then had to go back and patch up cases and uh, just trying to debug all this was, uh, was horrendous, but it was worthwhile in the end, that's for sure. It's uh, very happy with what came out of it. When Viva Piñata was announced, 
back in the day, the word universe was used. And another big part of the Viva Pinata universe was the TV show. Here's the quick fire scoop and how that came about and how those two things played off one another. So while we were developing uh, the first VP, um, we had lots of big ideas about how successful it was going to be and how amazing it was going to be. We like marketing and toys and all those things. So um, we actually got a, a partnership with uh, four kids to create a cartoon. They were commissioned to make a, a, a cartoon, you know, a children's cartoon series to support the support the game and you know, sort of vice versa, sort of build the IP up. We started developing a cartoon series, which basically took our characters and, and made it into a, a Saturday morning cartoon. Uh, four kids had got some ideas; they wanted some humour, and that suited us at Rare. Um, we weren't particularly bothered that we were going to f exactly follow the plot of the game because we wanted to give them the freedom to make the best TV show possible. That seemed like the most important thing. It felt really kind of like a good relationship where we were kind of working together. Um, we did a lot of, the team themselves did a lot of reviews of the work and the scripts that came back. So from a design point of view, people were looking how the script worked with the design and from a visual point of view as well. And it was kind of cool working with people making a TV show of the game you're making. It was, uh, it felt really exciting at the time, and uh, yeah, we rushed at the chance. I remember thinking that seeing Mumbo at E3 had been a kind of a big deal, but to see like you know a big cartoon series being commissioned for you know something that we were making, and then when the game launched, there was a big party they had at um, Santa Monica Pier, and they built I think it was the world's biggest piñata, and a few of few of the team went out to take part in that. So that was it was a big big deal. We always knew that we'd potentially go into like the, an ice world or kind of a sand world for, for VP2, um, but the cartoon was actually going to be there first, so I did some concepts for what an ice world would look like, and they, they kind of used it in the cartoon before we even got it in VP2, so it was good, it was a good relationship. So there were situations where I think it was the jelly, or sort of yeti-type creature. The first time anyone saw that um, was actually in the cartoon rather than in the game, so it's sort of trailblazed a, a character for us. And then the cartoon actually fed back into the game too, because uh, Langston, who set the, the challenges in uh, Trouble in Paradise, he came from the cartoon, and so we got a bit of the character, got a bit of the feel of the, the cartoon in our sequel. So no scandal, nothing. We all got on really well and respected each other's work. How's anyone supposed to sensationalise that headline? Honestly. Speaking of the sequel, let's hear about one edition that brought life through a lens to Viva Piñata Trouble in Paradise. Uh, when we got to the end of Viva Piñata 1, um, I think a lot of the, the team were very excited about what we'd produced, but always knew there was, there was more uh, to create. And whilst we lost quite a few people over to the, the Nuts and Bolts team at the time, the engineers all got together because we had all these grand plans for online, for trading, for streamlining a lot of the, the processes. So one of the features for Trouble in Paradise was the use of the live vision camera. Microsoft had just launched um, what was effectively a webcam for the Xbox. Our lead engineer, Will Bryan, had, he'd seen it. And one day he came to me and said, we could do something with this, um, with barcodes. I think QR codes and odds and sods like that were, were becoming to be more prevalent at the time. And Will just took it upon himself. I mean, this, this was a home project that he brought into the studio. And he'd done a little demonstration where he had the camera on his desk and he showed it a barcode and it made an animal appear in the garden. And instantly, I love that idea. I love the idea of a real world object that we could use all over the shop if we wanted to. And he turned Pinata Vision from barcodes into um, pinatas, accessories, animals, weathers that would just appear in the garden. And I think this captured a lot of people's imaginations. I had visions of us actually putting posters with barcodes on that people could snap with a camera and then scan those in and actually get new content into the game. So I really liked the idea straight away. So we kind of jumped on it and developed it almost despite anybody else. We kind of just went and did it independently. Microsoft never really asked for it. We just thought it was a good idea and went ahead to put it in. It was cool. It just kept our community together again for another whole game. And we have to say, the VP online community was an awesome community. You did good, Internet. You did good. <laughs> We heard earlier how the development team got involved in picking out Pinata names, but it didn't stop there. 
Those piñata voices? Not real animal noises. Oh no, classic, old school, rare. We did it ourselves. VP followed the, the tradition of rare games of having the, the devs be at the actual voices of the characters in the game. So um, my favorite one is the mouse, uh, which was voiced by Rico, um, a, a Japanese woman that, that I worked with for quite some time. Um, she was the mouse, and, and that's why the mouse is it's a Japanese mouse. That's why it says chew instead of squeak. Choo, 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 choo. There are some obvious ones like frogs croak, on, but there were things like the swan. Or I remember, I remember doing the swan. Alyssa, Alyssa did the swan. She was a, she was an animator on the project, and she had got the swan. I always came up with the people when they came to do the recording of the voices, and um, she said, "Well, what should I do?" And I said, "Well, it's a swan. You just do a posh noise." <laughs> And that's what she kind of did. And I thought it was good. <laughs> I was going to be the goose, but I, I, I don't voice any of the characters in the game. I was going to be the goose, but that day I had a sore throat, so I missed my chance of being in my own game, which was quite gutting. I did the voice of the, uh, of the newt gat, <laughs> which is the tiny newt creature. And I can't remember how it goes now. I know it hurt my voice after a very short time. <laughs> And that's pretty much how it was. Everybody just, you know, they signed up whether they wanted to do voices or not. And then we, Grant would arrange an appointment and we'd come up to the music studio and record it as we went along. Ladies and gentlemen, the donut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, well done, James. Of course, there's one other recognizable rare voice in the game that isn't a pinata, isn't there? <laughs> Hello? So I was asked to do placeholder voice acting for Lee Foss um, and um, I think we spent about four and a half days recording like a bunch of dialogue. CDOS runs much faster since you started to get seeds from him. Justin, who was directing me, uh, asked me to kind of envision I was reading a storybook and you know my daughter was kind of six or seven at the time so I was doing a lot of reading so I, I always read Lee Foss's lines. So it, she sounds a little bit condescending I think because it does sound like she's talking to a child. And I still get people ask, like when they realise that I was the voice of Lee Foss, oh, I say something in Lee Foss, and I always go, congratulations, you've got a fizzly bear. <laughs> the other voice I did, not many people know this, I was Cameo's jump voice. All I had to do was stand in front of a microphone and go, uh, uh, uh. Some days are, are better than others, to be fair. Lee Foss was a good day. <laughs> And on that note, we're done. We have smashed open the piñata of knowledge and gorged ourselves on its contents. And now the party's over and we feel a bit funny. But if you're still hungry, check out our five things rundown for other games. In the meantime, we're going to curl up inside a fudge hog house. Look, it's so nice in there. Feel free to like and subscribe if you had a good time. There's a total of 10 more things you didn't know right here. Five for Battletoads and five for Blastcore. Meanwhile, the making of Viva Piñata is included in Rare Replay for Xbox One. And just one more thing. Congratulations! You got a Tunicorn!